Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. This is great. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, I am a, a member of the Travis Area Historical Society. Um, I've been secretary for maybe three years now. My name is Jennifer Liu. Um, I have a degree from U of M. I studied history there. And as I was going to school every summer, I was working at the zoo. Um, and so I was there a few years full time after college. And so this is a personal project for me. Um, I certainly love the history, but there's also a lot of personal feelings involved. So I'll try to balance that. Um, and I, I remember living a lot of the end of the zoo days. Um, but also looking back into the early times is, is quite interesting too. Um, much thanks to the Jarvis Area District Library staff because they put this all together so it can be online as well, um, live on Zoom. And that's been really great for a lot of our programs. We try to have programs monthly here, um, I think November through June. Um, so I'll just get started. We'll do the questions at the end. If there's anything pertinent, I have no problem stopping and answering questions as we go. Um, but yeah, I think we have to work first. So this is gonna be a history of the Clinch Park Zoo and the Clinch Park area. Um, and I thought that the best place to start would be with why we call it Clinch Park. Um, R. Floyd Clinch is a name you might have heard in other historical society kind of talks. Uh, he was a son-in-law of Tracy Lay. So Hannah and Lay were two of the founding fathers of Traverse City. And um, Clinch was married to one of their daughters, or one of Tracy Lay's daughters. Um, and so he got very involved in the area, and he was probably best known for putting together the park place, as we know it, the brick structure, um, which went up in the 30s, or 1930, after there was a boarding house there before called the Campbell House. Um, so the Clinch family donated a lot of the land that the zoo, the second iteration of the zoo, stood on. Um, he was a Chicago businessman. I also was doing some research and I found a few funny other business deals that he did. He had a, um, I think it was called the Traverse City Refrigerator Company. It was an ice box company that lasted for a few years. Um, so clearly he really wanted to invest in the area and he deeded a lot of the land down there to the city um, for this endeavor. Uh, his son is the one on the right, that's Duncan Clinch, and his name is still on the marina, the yacht harbor, um, and that comes in there later. So, the zoo really started, though, with Conrad Foster. Um, always or often, you can tell, or you can find him in photos because he has a cigar, um, and also usually done up pretty well. Um, he was born in 1875, he lived till 1940. And he, in his early days, worked for traveling services, Barnum and Bailey. Um, I think one report I saw said that he was a treasurer for them, um, but certainly had a love for entertainment and animals and that kind of came to Traverse City. We were talking a lot about him when the film festival started, when the state theater was redone, because he was also the manager of the Lyric Theater which was in the State Theater building originally. So a lot of the information I got on Conrad Foster came from a memoir written by his daughter, Helen Keene. And this is in the archives here at the library. And it is kind of an anecdotal sort of story, but there's some really fun things, character things that you can get out of, out of it. Um, and of course, you kind of try to figure out where the facts are, but she really thought highly of her father, and it seems like he was very influential in a lot of the things that got put together with the city. Um, so the original idea, that, so that's him with some bear cubs, and there's going to be a theme, really, of a lot of these, these um, big figures in taking care of the animals and, and expanding the zoo really raised them themselves. Um, and they had bears in their house and they figured out how to raise young cubs and other animals. And so we'll get through some of that too. So 
I don't know about the quality of this, but I really like this photo because if you see in the bottom, I'm left and right challenge, um, bottom right corner, that, that kind of circle dot there, um, that is an old cobblestone fountain. I have another picture of it. Um, and that sat on the corner up front and pass. And there are some records that they used to put fish in that fountain um, in like the, the late 20s, early 30s. And people would come and admire the fish, um, perhaps even sturgeon, which were a, a big, unique thing to the area. And Conrad Foster noticed this and decided that, hey, wouldn't it be great if we had an aquarium? Um, it seemed to be a draw. We were thinking about how the area was expanding. And so in 1930, he, um, it, the recount is that he uh, went to area businessmen's their business people downtown and raised $4,000 um, to build an aquarium. Um, the city gets involved later. It seems like he was later a mayor and a city commissioner, but at the very beginning, he had to do some convincing to see how this was gonna get put together. So there's that fountain from those old colored um, postcards. And below that is the Traverse City Aquarium. Um, I've only ever seen photos kind of like this. There's a few other black and white um, where you see that building that sits. We're going to see another building that kind of orients you, but you see the path in on that photo on the right. Um, right over the river, right over the Boardman, um, if you're headed towards the bay overpass. And so that aquarium proved to be pretty popular. It was built in 1931. And so Conrad Foster decided to do more with that area. What we will see, again, that black and white photo on the right, um, the building all the way on the right over there is the bathhouse. There's a bathhouse down there for many years. Um, and then we'll also get a museum as well. So, oh yes. So these are these, these are the stories that I don't want to forget. So um, according to on Foster's daughter's memoirs. Um, he wanted to do this. He put the, he gathered the money to do this, and then he got a local barber to fish the fish for him and to stock the aquarium because it was all local. And that will be a theme throughout the zoo and like the animal intake is it was it, they were animals um, and fish and reptiles native to the area. It kind of seems a little funny now if we think about it, but it really was a draw to pull people. To northern Michigan. Never seen these things up close. So there's the entryway. Sorry, that one's a little low resolution. Um, I like that there's lights on the side. There's that bridge across the boardman. They were trying to make it into an attraction. Um, that was a way to get people here. According to some accounts, that first those first few years, about 250,000 people attended the aquarium and so they knew they had something going. So here we can kind of see, I love these aerial photos where we kind of get an idea of what it looked like pre-parkway, right? So we have all the we have all the cars and everything parked along the bay. Um, we have that bridge entrance and you probably heard that original zoo was built um, where the farmers market is now and then was moved as the parkway was built. Um, I heard, I, I didn't quite get the full story on this, but I think some of that land was donated by someone with the last name Ott, O-T-T. Um, and so a few people were involved as this was getting put together. So 1931 was the aquarium, soon after was the bathhouse and the museum, the Con Foster Museum, which is still up, was built in 1934. So this building is part of that original zoo um, structure. I think, I, I wish I could find more photos of this. And if anyone has seen any, please let me know because especially the inside that, you know, those big windows in front really look like it probably was an interesting building to be inside. Um, but that was torn down when the zoo moved. And so there's not a lot of, of that. Um, Notable when this started to take off, uh, WPA funds were used to build a lot of these buildings. Um, 
And because this is getting into, you know, 35, where we do want to have people work and we need money to have them work. And they came up with some good ideas. Um, then it, Con Foster perhaps did some own fun, his own fundraising and raised $8,000 to start the Zoom proper. In the beginning, we do have a lot of records of some of the animals that were there, certainly bears. Um, they did have names back then too. Fritz the bear seems to be one of the first ones. Sam the eagle, who may have lived over 40 years, we're gonna get to some of the animal photos, um, even moved across the parkway. So some of them started and then even had to move their homes. Um, here is some of those structures. There's a zookeeper structure up to the top there and this Heart of Nature's Playground, which ended up as this cobblestone um, display, ended up on a lot of postcards of the era. Uh, on that picture on the right, I really like the probably purple Martin birdhouse looking like the park place. <laughs> So here we have the museum building, again, 1934. Um, big dedication, It's and that's probably the opening. Um, I'm sure that some of you that may have attended Peg's talks on dating historical photos can help me better with some of these. Um, I'm wondering where they took the photo from. Um, it's, it's pretty kind of, you know, almost an aerial view. And then we have the Elise Hannah bathhouse. That was named in honor of uh, Hannah's daughter-in-law, so Julius Hannah's wife. Um, she donated money to, to put that up. Um, and as we've had conversations on the Historical Society Facebook page and all this, some people remember going to the bathhouse and having a changing place. It was torn down, I think, in 69. I don't where I put that. It looked a lot like the Con Foster Museum. It was built very similarly. So this is the day locomotive, which a lot of the top two photos, which a lot of people remember. Um, it was on display since 1933 down there. It was on loan. Um, from the Day Mill in Frankfurt, uh, David H. Day kind of put it there as an attraction. Um, it was built in 1878 um, and was at the zoo until 1965 when it was sold to a private buyer. Um, the big wheels are also something that a lot of people remember down lower right, um, used for logging. And they were on display for quite a while. There's some record eagle stories in the 70s of them getting pulled in and refurbished and, you know, cleaned up over the years. What became of the castle? What's that? What became of the, uh, the chase what? what? What became of the chase on? Oh, um, <coughs> is that the big wheels or the locomotive? Sorry. The big wheels? I actually don't know. I know. Um, I believe the last time I saw them, they were out at the Empire Museum, and they're out front at the Empire Museum. So they, they were salvaged, and I'm not sure what the legal status is, whether they belong to Empire or the city, I'm not sure, but they <laughs> they were out there pre-pandemic, pre -pandemic, I was going to say. And I guess I don't know where they came from either. I'm sure there's some records somewhere on there. Um, and so also in the early 30s, the miniature city was started. Um, we have some buildings in the back. Uh, this was also a WPA project. Um, it sounds like that Con Foster got interested in this idea, but there was a man named Charles Sawyer who got a dollhouse or one of the city carpenters made a dollhouse for his daughter. And he thought this was a really interesting thing um, to kind of get behind and then commissioned or had a lot of the city workers who were unemployed in the winter um, work on these buildings. And then that, that provided work throughout the winter months. So some of the names, Dan Ray, um, Fred Mink, Fred Schiedel, 
city carpenters, but also city workers that kind of had skill to put into this. Um, over 100 buildings. Uh, I've, I, I think I've heard a few different kind of people are better with numbers and and ratios can help me with this. But um, I saw both one 32nd, 30 seconds of a full size replica, also three eighths of an inch to a foot. Um, so I don't know, I, they seem to try to be accurate. They're working off blueprints of some of the original buildings. Um, and we'll see what happens with that as things go on. There was a coin operated train that a lot of people remember. Um, so you could pay, you could pay um, a few cents to have the train go around. Uh, also an airplane, I think I have a photo of that in the next that went around um, and a sawmill. Sawmill. Yeah. Some of the, yeah, some of the stats that I was reading, it, it took 248 hours to make a building um, or a few of the first buildings and then almost as many hours to paint them. There's that plane in the upper left. So it was traveling around. Um, there's some good mechanics going on with some of this stuff um, and some good, Good workmanship. So it was the iconic, a lot of the buildings were iconic buildings of Traverse City and some also homes, which you'll see back there. Um, then it got moved, but we'll talk about that too. So you also see that there's only a little hedge around it. This becomes part of the problem with the Manager City and the zoo area in general is how do you keep that space separate um, from people or how do you gain access? So over there on the left is Con Foster. Um, and this is the waterfowl pond that they had there. Uh, by most accounts, he was very, um, he was a, a large supporter of the indigenous people here. They accepted him. He was, you know, very heartfelt in his support. Um, so this was in no way a mockery. It was out of respect. Um, but you, there, are, there are a few photos of him walking around the zoo, um, kind of in this display. The waterfowl will come in again later because there's also an adjacent property that was affiliated with the zoo called um, Fulton Park that not a lot of people know about, but there's always been a connection to raising native um, birds and also not native birds. There's an eagle. I think that is Sam the Eagle. So um, a lot of the names, and, and I think it's wonderful that even back in the 30s, they were naming these animals. They really were trying to take care of them. Um, certainly the standards of care evolved. Um, but Sam the Eagle really did live a long life there. Um, when we get to the 70s, there are a few times where they were trying, or people tried to liberate the animals. They would um, cut open the cages and most of the time, Sam the Eagle would stay there. Now, now we know that, you know, not really being able to fly and also knowing that that is a home base, they're not likely to, you know, just immediately escape, but there were attempts. Um, also a crow. Um, again, we see photos of Colin Foster kind of around the place with these kind of animals around him. Um, I think there's one story in Helen's account where he was showing around one of his old circus buddies and had a baby skunk in his pocket um, and then showed it to this guy who was reportedly a lion tamer. And the guy was like, oh, no, no, I would much rather deal with lions than skunks. <laughs> with the birds, um, peacocks. I don't know if you guys have been to the Detroit Zoo or even the Garland Zoo I went to recently up in um, up in the UP, past the bridge. Um, that one reminds me a lot of Lynch Park in some ways, but having kind of peacocks or other birds wandering the space, being free to get in and out of places, um, they would end up downtown. A lot of people remember that. They'd have to get like wrangled back in. Um, and it kind of gives a different feel to the space. Uh, down at the bottom right there, um, it looks like that, that might be the guinea pig house. We're getting to the guinea pig house too. Again, Garden Zoo has a similar thing. Yeah. 
There they are. So tiny little replicas of places for little guinea pigs to live. So certainly wild animals, bears, some of the early ones are um, certainly elk, bison, uh, some badgers, otters, um, then coyotes, we get into wolves. Uh, but then also there was a barnyard at one point and tiny little, tiny little animals. So these are some of that, those, those con foster days. And he died in 1940. So some of these photos where he's around because he's in the back of that upper right photo of the cigar again. Um, and he could clearly liked showing off this face. So we have bears walking around on leashes. Um, and the cages, I mean, you can see the enclosures were pretty much chain link and concrete. That's sort of how we knew how to keep animals in. Um, some of the more personal accounts, they, they did have an attachment to these animals, but then sometimes when the animals got too big, they had to find different places to go. They weren't being paraded around as much. Um, I didn't include it, but there's some photos of like at different children's groups with the bear cubs and that kind of thing, which has since become that was for an era, you know, a, a tourist attraction in other places as well. Um, and it, but you have to think about what happened to the animals after that wasn't so cute and fun. Um, yeah, otter in the bottom right. Parkway was built. Um, again, that old zoo building, everything torn up. Uh, the parkway was built in, and I was getting conflicting dates, 53, 52, 52. Um, and there was a rededication ceremony for the zoo in 56. So there was some transition time. I'm sure they actually built enclosures as it was going on. Um, when we get into kind of the next era, there was a longtime zookeeper and park superintendent, Harold Doc Ashelman. Um, and he I had the opportunity to talk to him um, at one point, and he also had a lot of written accounts where he, they walked some of the animals across. Um, they had to figure out how to get a bear out of a like enclosure that they had moved it in, and then the bear would not move out of it. So they had to de they had to disassemble it around them. Um, there also seemed to be some confusion about how to get the elk. It like with probably with a transport vehicle. And so he decided that they needed to do that at a certain time of year when they dropped their antlers. Um, so things that we think about with very large animals. About, don't think about a girl. Um, the new zoo was funded by the city general fund when it moved. Um, and then we get to the hill. And the parkway is a big, big issue right now because when we think about it, it made sense probably at the time to build something to help people get across the there across the town, but it has cut off a lot of the area. And we all know that then we have to figure out what we're doing now. So, I mean, similar to Con Foster, this is Doc Eshelman. He had bear cubs, he had bear cubs in his house. There are accounts of his family. Um, going through some of this. He was the zoo director. Uh, he was born in 1922, uh, died in 2012. Um, he visited zoos during his service in the war. So he had an interest in, in animals as he settled back down here. Um, there are, I'm trying to, yeah, he was interested and engaged enough that some of his techniques, like what do we feed baby bears and these kind of things were tapped into from zoos around the country. Um, other places uh, wanted his knowledge as he was getting you know, experience with this. Again, similar kind of buildings though, similar kind of enclosures. At a barnyard. Um, he also had a Channel 7 children's show. Anyone, I, and I like I saw that and I haven't seen anything else about it. Um, but this gets into an era where we're starting to think of why we have zoos, what zoos can teach us, um, 
how we can have captive animals, but also perhaps learn from that or use it in a more educational um, way. And that, that took some transitioning. Um, you can see here, we still have a lot of the amusement type rides. Um, carousel is down there, pony rides. Um, this train, which it seems like was put in when they moved to the zoo across the parkway, was a different train than a lot of people remember, um, a miniature steam engine that showed up later. Um, I did find an article about this one. It came from a local couple who had it as a hobby train and then they donated it um, part of the CMN, CNM railway. There's the train with our miniature city. So the city was on display until 74, um, 73 or 74. If you look at that fence, again, with how we're keeping things separate or structured, uh, there was a lot of vandalism at night, especially. Um, there, was, there were some articles of, you know, it seems like people were distracting guards and then were roaming patrols and then like hopping the fence on the other side. Um, some buildings were stolen, some buildings were destroyed. And besides that, it's just a lot of upkeep because there was never a decision to make no one ever made the decision of whether or not they were going to continually update the buildings or if they were just going to keep them at a set year. And so every time they'd pull them in for the winter, they would try to do renovations on them or repaint them. And they were out in the elements. And so like the amount of hours that it took to keep that together in the way that it was displayed was really tough. Um, and so it was pulled down um, or it was pulled out in 74. And then there was a group that was trying to, I thought this was, this was neat because it's just a small little blip in the miniature city, but um, the Traverse Area Model Pilot Society got involved with like Girl Scout troops and a few different others really trying to do some large renovations. And it went back up in 78 and 79, but then it still was deemed unfeasible. Um, the infrastructure though, like the, the moat or the, the river um, and all the like cement that were the streets and all that was not torn out until 82 um, when they put in the new train. So we had some Wolverines. Um, the personal history of a lot of the animals is really interesting. And again, standards of care changed. Um, it seems, I have no doubt that um, keepers cared for the animals. It was just what did we need for animals at that particular point in time. Um, wolverines in the wild have thousands um, of miles of territory. And then we think that, you know, they, they are in a space and that's a little, that's a little taxing. Um, there are at least two. One did come from Alaska in 59. Um, and that one I think was Roscoe. When Roscoe died, they, they sent him to a taxidermist and Roscoe was in the education room actually at the zoo for many years after that. Um, and then they got another um, that supposedly was trapped in Canada, which brings into kind of interesting, as the zoo is transitioning, interesting ideas. So like, where do you get animals from? What is the purpose of this place? And while there is some, uh, some documentation of acquiring animals on purpose. It's usually the ones that they felt like they needed to have. A lot were uh, local orphans or injured somehow. Um, and this zoo, but also many other zoos across the country, provided a place for them. Um, you know, you find coyote puppies, what do you do with them? Um, and there were a few that that even happened when I was there. So we have more waterfowl, look at our deer. Um, the bison, there were often buffalo there. And there was one, it seems like there was one instance where they went further afield to get them, but often they were on the from the Olsen herd. Um, and there would be one living there for a few years, probably having a pretty good time of it. Um, and then going back to their group. Oh, yeah. So this is my notes. So Doc Eshelman, a lot of the other keepers, they were raising again orphaned wildlife. 
Um, and so sometimes they had a lot of fawns, a lot of deer. They would release them. Um, there was one report of a few going to Marion Island at the time, um, kind of settling out there because they thought that would be a place that wouldn't be too different than captivity. You know, it's kind of restricted space. There's not a ton of people out there. Um, things like the antler sheds. So elk lose their antler, elk and deer lose their antlers every year. Um, there was always a list of local business places that wanted those sheds, like sweaters. Some ended up there. <laughs> oh, and then I always like to bring this up because I've never seen a photo of it. Um, there is some documentation that there was a moose for a while. Moose are really hard to keep in captivity though. Um, and so some records said that there was one for a few years and they would cut fresh um, browse for it every day. Um, that's really hard to upkeep and you don't see moose very often in captivity because they really are hard to keep. Um, so if anyone has a picture of a moose at the zoo, I'd love to see it. So then we have, yes, coyotes, wolves, um, they were kept track of it in records pretty well. Um, of note, they, there were litters born to both coyotes and wolves when they were there. And that was not that usual for captivity. Um, and so there's documentation of them, like some of the, um, some of the young ones getting moved to other zoos. Uh, there was one note I saw that some ended up in Isle Royal. I'm not entirely sure, you know, where we could figure that out, but they were corresponding with the DNR about a lot of this too, as um, wolves were watched more as endangered species. The one on the right, I think is um, Igor, and that was a, that was someone's pet. So this is also a theme of how some of the animals ended up there. Um, it seemed that some, some gentlemen had bought a wolf um, pup and then the wolf pup became an adult and scared his neighbors and he needed somewhere for it to go. Um, yes, and then I think the one on the bottom there is Kina. Um, and that wolf came to the zoo at five weeks old, which is really young. Um, and probably, you know, a lot of close contact with people that wolf particularly got let out twice um, or tried to, not tried to escape, people were trying to liberate. Um, once when he was very young and then another, another instance where he came back, he came back to the back of the zoo. Um, either he got out of the car, I, I remember hearing stories of some of the zookeepers, from some of the zookeepers that I worked with about like where that went, how that went. Um, I also found a really interesting letter to um, Doc as the park superintendent, or it was Buck Williams maybe, um, from the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, uh, asking for a wolf for a production of Peter and the Wolf. I don't know what they were gonna do with it, but like they wanted a wolf on loan. Um, they denied that request. Um, there was some very polite language about how that was not a good time to move a wolf and look for a wolf closer to you. Um, but I mean, what we do with animals and how that works is it's changed a lot. So yeah, a lot of instances of, of pups born. So this is Fulton Park. Um, Fulton Park is still a city park. Um, it's off of Carter Road. And I haven't been there in a while. Um, and I, I'm now a member of the, the city parks commissioner, so I should go over there and see how it goes or how it's going. But at the zoo times, they had a lot of, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Walter Fulton, who was a bird hobbyist. He had a lot of exotic pheasants. Um, the peacocks were often over there or they were breeding them and then moved them to the zoo. Shetland ponies were over there. Um, and it, it was a pretty operated kind of thing. Um, wish I could find more photos of that. Too. Mm -hmm. But in, it was 10, it's 10 acres, it's still really a large park. Um, 
And I think, yeah, Walter Fulton was 82 years old in 74. So he had been doing this for a while. Turkeys, um, there are stories of relocating, you know, flocks of turkeys to different places as well. Some of the later things that we remember the zoo, the, um, the turtle pond, uh, I had, a, there, we certainly had turtles in the turtle pond. Um, there were stories, again, thinking about how things are regulated or maintained. Um, you know, I heard stories of people dumping soap in the turtle pond, um, you know, after hours. I mean, you know, these kind of things where, yeah, it's hard to, hard to keep track of everyone. Um, they did patrol and they did have some, you know, sort of security, but I don't know if anyone remembers the old birdhouse. That was like right at the edge, even when they had a perimeter fence. Um, really easy to kind of even stick fingers in cages. Um, I've seen a lot of a, a lot of the old records with like bite bite incidents. Um, it was usually the bears or the otters, um, and people thinking that yeah, it would be nice to pet them, and them thinking yeah, probably not. Um, so yeah, there were reptiles and amphibians. The turtle pond. Um, there was an exhibit in '69 of native snakes. Um, and that was the old aquarium building. There ended up being a newer one even after that. Um, that wishing well, but then there's another wishing well, which we'll look at in a, in a second. Um, back to the miniature city. So once the miniature city, the, the city, so this is where we get into, not necessarily the politics, but how the city works with the zoo, right? Um, early days, it was, this is an attraction, and this is a reason for people to come to Trump City. Everything kind of worked in harmony. Um, then we get into, why is it here? And we have different opinions. Um, the city sold uh, the miniature city uh, to Howard Stoddard in 83 for $3,000. Um, he attempted restoration along with a daughter of one of the original carpenters. I think that was Mrs. Mark Williams and put the put it back up on display um as it says on us 31 south um only for a few years really trying to get the interest back there again at this point some of the buildings may have gotten lost or um but a lot of them were still there so he died in 89 and his brother tried to sell it there's like a record eagle um advertisement trying to sell it for like $12,000. Um, but it ended up being donated to the Music House Museum. Um, and that's where a lot of those pieces are now. And we have some here. Um, Jim, one of our historical society members, um, brought over. So definitely check that out at the end. Brochures over the ages. Again, kind of highlighting why, what are we doing with the zoo? Um, what is the purpose? Um, how we're presenting to um, the, the community. And so I, they started doing more like the little brochures and, and I have a few of them if you want to look through. Um, descriptions of the animals, what the animals, you know, what or where the animals would live or their natural habitats and these kind of things. So you get an educational component into all of this. Um, as this was, well, I, part of what we're getting into or starting to think about is in the 80s, um, the city was wondering the purpose of the zoo, but also a lot of people were wondering how the animals were kept and what was going on. So there's a lot of reports of um, people writing letters to the editor and doing studies and trying to figure out if, if Traverse City wants a zoo. Um, in, yeah, there are objections to the city commission brought forth in like the, in the mid seventies. Um, the Zoological Society, so Grand Traverse Zoological Society was founded in 1978 and put together a master plan for the zoo, um, trying to put together these components. And we are housing animals that aren't going other places or cannot survive in the wild. And what does this look like for Traverse City? I mean, we also have to think about this is prime, like real estate. Um, and so that puts pressure on the area as well. In 86, um, the Zoological Society requested that there be a zoo director. 
um, in official capacity to see if we can kind of steer where it's going. Throughout all of this, there were inspections. Um, you know, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has standards for animal care. They'd come in and, you know, make sure everything was okay. I think there was a brief time that it was closed for a month or so for um, maintenance kind of security concerns. But that's then where it's going. I have these in here because thinking about the animals that perhaps didn't have another place to go or unique animals that gave us some idea of things out in the world that we may not normally see. There is an albino groundhog in the front there, but then the albino snapping turtle or pinky. Um, and he does have a deformed shell that probably had to do with um, malnutrition when he was younger. You see that even in pet turtles, um, but rather unusual. I think he, they tried to breed him in some capacity. Um, I am sure that there are people in the room that remember um, more, but I know we also had an albino raccoon that was there when I was there um, with her sister. Um, and so some of those curiosities. And again, thinking about our entertainment and education. So in the, and this is the year I was there, and now I'm not gonna remember yours. Um, so this is an eagle. Um, in our zoo, and the eagles hatched um, some eggs while they were there, which is really unusual. Um, that old birdhouse was so grown in. I don't know if anyone remembers it, but it still had those those wire cages, but like the trees were growing through everything. Um, it was a really sheltered spot. And twice, um, they raised a baby eaglet to be released, um, and they banded them and released them. Um, I actually went back and visited the two eagles that were there that got rehomed when the zoo closed in, in Missouri um, years later, and it wasn't nearly the place that they had lived before. Um, and that is, you know, opinion, but it also, like, they were in the woods, but it wasn't that same kind of feel, and they must have felt secure enough to, you know, mate and raise chicks, which was a pretty big deal. There we go. They're there. <laughs> and then moved. Um, this, though, is the train that a lot of people remember. Uh, Spirit of Traverse City. It was a real steam engine. Um, and so anecdotally, what I remember is it would break down frequently because it's hard to maintain. There were some great engineers, and there were some really good hobby engineers that loved it and really wanted to you know, put that into it. Um, but as far as an, as, as far as a um, attraction goes, it wasn't, you know, that reliable. Um, the zoo acquired it in 82. It was, I think, built in 1948. Um, and in 2012, it was there past the time that the zoo closed, it moved to the Buckley Old Engine Show. And so people have seen it out there. Now we're getting into the animals. I remember, um, these are photos I took because I was in a black and white photography phase, but um, <laughs> coyotes, um, those, those two coyotes were orphans when we got them. Um, I think they were about eight weeks old. We got three. Um, and that was, that was the experience. Um, there was not a lot of, or there was an acquisition on purpose. It was, there were still wild animals as we're in Traverse City up against wildlife that needed places to go. Sunny right there, uh, I don't know if anyone remembers Sunny the cougar. Um, she did have one eye when I was removed. Um, she was a confiscated pet. And so someone thought it was a great idea to get a cougar as a pet and they're not. Um, so she had, she always had a limp because she was declawed irregularly. Um, she was sweet though. And uh, I think the bobcats were also confiscated pets. Um, Exotic animal laws are better now, but also very variable. Um, it's surprising what people can own. And we've all heard stories of how this goes awry. Um, but this was a place that they could be, that could meet their needs. That's Ace the Crow. Um, Yes, Ace was there for a very long time. By, by record, she was older than I was when I started working there. Um, she never particularly liked me. 
<laughs> she did love uh, one of the zookeepers I'll get to in a minute, who's here, uh, Tracy Mikowski, and they were they were best buddies. Um, I particularly knew that Ace did not like me because she would she would she could talk, not in sentences. She said hello. She laughed like a person would laugh. She caught like a person would caught at a crow. Um, but every time every time I'd approach or often she would say hello, I'd come in and she'd say goodbye. She had some idea of what that was. It was very dismissive. Um, either that or just stabbing at the, the thing and looking at me pointedly. They're very smart. Uh, she had been injured falling from a nest. She had some really messed up feet and couldn't fly. Um, but she's some she's one that a lot of people remember because people would be outside the area talking to her after hours. Um, some maintaining that she would swear. Um, we'll ask Tracy about that. I, don't, I, I never heard it. Um, so then we get into the zoo closing. Um, it was kind of a perfect storm. Some of you probably remember following this. I, again, was a, you know, a new employee and there was an ad hoc committee made by the city commission to study the feasibility of the zoo, what they wanted to happen with it. Um, Time location and not a great time to be spending money. Other zoos were having trouble at this time too. Um, Detroit Zoo, a few went private, Saginaw Children's Zoo. Um, and the Zoological Society throughout those last few years was raising a lot of money on their own to do a lot of improvements um, for the enclosures. And a lot of it did change um, and did get bit, uh, bigger and fit the needs of the animals more. Um, we did a lot of enrichment, which was changing things around the enclosure. So the bears would get put in inside every day for lunch and we would be out hiding peanuts or smearing jam or putting like scents out. A lot of boxes that, um, that they can tear into and those kind of things. Still a lot of um, wildlife rehab happening then too. Um, and, and raising animals that still needed places to go. Also management was an interesting one. Um, if there was a bear loose in town, which still occasionally happened, it was calling zoo, you know, zoo workers to go try to figure that out. Um, so this, these are actually ones I took on the last day it was open to the public, 2006. Um, and when it was decided to close, there was a group that wanted to um, have like essentially take those animals knowing that they needed a place to be. They could not survive on their own um, and, and have their own private park. That just never materialized. Um, they did not have the plans for it. They did not have the funding for it. And as it came down to things, um, it really was finding the best homes for the animals that could be found. That ended up being across the country. Um, and a lot of them really ended up in good places, although it was kind of heartbreaking. Um, there's Sunny again in, in her spot at the Wildlife Science Center in Minnesota. Um, that center had been affiliated with Clinch Park for a while. The wolves were on loan from them. Um, and so there was a connection going back and forth. Uh, they did get some money from the city to um, the city and the zoological society to build new enclosures. Um, they, were, they were large, they were in the woods. Um, coyotes, cougars, bears went over there, um, foxes, bobcats. Here's Tracy, I'm not gonna point you out, I'm sorry. Um, so Tracy was the next Doc Eshelden as, and my mentor when I was there at the zoo, but she raised a lot of the animals also in her house occasionally. Um, Squirt the Otter was one of these, where it was um, found in a field. And what Tracy ended up doing was uh, writing a children's book about the story of the otter. Um, and went back and visited Squirt uh, in 2016. There's another kind of record eagle about it. Um, and that went, Squirt went to Tupper Lake, or Tupper Lake, New York, um, to a really nice center there. I ended up taking an otter down to Jackson's in Bill, Florida. Um, I'm trying to think, the Eagles went to Missouri. Um, I think the Lynx went out to somewhere out west. So it really was this coordinated effort of finding the best ones possible. 
Um, and that that took a little bit of looking, and it was it was the drive of the people that really cared for the animals to find the best places. Um, we did a lot of enrichment, and and other zoos did too, but to varying degrees. And so there's effort put in to make sure they're going to the right places. So, sad. you have to have the sad Zoom closed photo. Um, but the area now, we've all been down there. Um, that Otter building was one of the last one built, that or the Beaver building on both sides, that's still there. Um, they've planted trees around the outside. That wishing well is still there. So the other buildings in the back there, you can see it. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, not a lot of the, the zoo is still recognizable. They put in a splash pad, um, maintains the name. I just, I, I love walking down there um, and seeing that there's still these, these stickers of otters on the, on the windows of that building. Yeah. What year was that otter display put in? That was so lovely. Oh, the place. new Tracy. That's really, I, I don't remember what year that was. Yeah, I know. It's me and dates is not, that's not ours what I get to. But again, yeah, that's, I think I, it was built when soon before I was there, there was an old small animal aquarium building. And then um, the, that one was one of the newer ones. I think the bear enclosure was the next one to be renovated that didn't, didn't quite get there. Um, I totally can find that out though. It's the lived history trying to figure out um, exactly. So yeah, um, they reused some of the buildings. The barnyard building is still there. Um, one of the things that I really, um, well, I learned a lot from, but also appreciated from the zoo was there was a lot of community involvement and like things that the zoo did that not everyone knew. So we picked up roadkill deer um, and we would actually butcher those for the animals and save that meat. Um, we would pick up salmon from the weir and the salmon runs, um, often trout from the trout pond during cherry festival. And so um, I, I'm thinking about the barn area because that's where the deer lived and the elk lived, but that's also where we would process deer. Um, I learned a lot of life skills at the zoo. Um, so yeah, there's there are so many stories and there's so many things that can be put into you know a study of this. Um, I wanted this to be a general overview. There's also so many more animal stories and that's really where a lot of the heart is. Um, but it was a fixture in Traverse City for a very long time. Um, many people have memories of the zoo. And, um, you know, they, there are understandable reasons how things change, but it's, it's worth remembering, I think. So that's, that's enough of me just talking there. So, okay. So I will take questions. I know there's other people in the room that can answer questions for you too as we get into some of this or what or memories that you might have. I mean, that's part of it as well. There's a comment on yes. Zoom that Anne said, it's interesting to see, and this was um, a couple slides in, um, to see the early parking on Front Street with car noses pointed towards the buildings. I wonder when it changed to parallel parking. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, there are some people, well, like Larry, maybe Peg or Stephen, that, you know, you, you know when those changes happened for the, you know, the, the front street directional changes and how people were parking and that kind of thing. The question was parking straight towards buildings. Yes. The parallel parking, I can testify for the 50s, so is that. And uh, the one-way streets were like 65. Tracy went to visit one of the others, yeah. Um, and <laughs> um, and that was, yeah, that was, I think, a great experience. I what I appreciate is there was some press on it, you know, the record eagle put a story out there and, and it was recognized that these animals were important to the to the area. Um, I visited the Eagles, strangely enough, because I happened to be in Minnesota or in Missouri um, and, and saw them there. Uh, when we moved 
a lot of, because quite a few of them went to Forest Lake, Minnesota. Um, we did that in ships. So the coyotes went first, and I remember going back and visiting the coyotes I knew a month or so later. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ace, Ace stayed local. Um, she ended up living with uh, the zoo veterinarian at the time, Dr. Jerry Harrison, um, and had a great long, um, long life with them. Um, I actually, I remember, this is my story of Ace. Um, I remember watching her for him uh, once when he like had a trip or something just because we had, she still didn't like me. I mean, she was older, <laughs> so like we didn't have the same problems, but she still was, yeah, she still was Ace. <laughs> question of was Dr. Clark involved with the zoo for a time also? I remember him talking about that. Yes, I think there were, and I, I know there, there are definitely more people to be talked about in this story. Um, he was a veterinarian, yeah, for the zoo at some point, and there were a few local veterinarians that stepped in at different points in time. Yes. Um, I served, I was fortunate to serve on the zoological uh, Society board for the last 10 years. Um, I thank you for your really balanced, long uh, survey. Uh, and in that, that survey, one can see that those decades of transition from simple tourist attraction to at its end to a, a really a clear mission, which unfortunately wasn't possible but a, an educational mission um, using animals that simply could not survive on their own in a natural situation, uh, focused on animals that in, in all cases were related presently, and in a few instances historically, to our actual natural environment surroundings. And that, that morphed to that vision, I think was was a really fine one. It's unfortunate that, that well, for several, several things. Uh, it, expenses just outran the city's ability to maintain it. Um, was, and that opportunity was lost to relate up close and natural, seeing the audience right there, knowing that they're, they're around us, um, to lose that opportunity. But, it's such a joy to go down there summer days now and see that space, which was becoming more and more was fenced off, you had to pay for admission, and becoming now just busy with adults relaxing and children <coughs> playing. So it in the end, it's been a delightful trade. Um, yeah, right. there's, there's definitely, yeah, I, the emotions involved it, I mean, because it was a personal thing for a lot of people, and even visitors, you know, and that, that ability to connect close, and then sometimes too close, it's like that balance as they were trying to make that transition, um, and yeah, yeah. Other comments? Okay. Look at the, the, the building over the back. Yeah, I remember you doing